In this session, we will address the issue of uh, strategy implementation. Strategy implementation is a very critical part of the strategy process. Um, during the last few uh, sessions, we have been looking at uh, issues like communication and network analysis, uh, team building. These are all important facets of strategy implementation. We will now bring all these together and uh, look at the whole topic of strategy implementation during this session. Our learning objectives will be uh, to look at the concept, to understand the concept of management by objectives. How do we do resource allocation in companies? How do we fix performance measures in companies? What are the importance of performance measures? What are the importance of budgets in uh, companies? And we will wind up the session by looking at typical problems in strategy implementation. Let's start by um, looking at what a management professional has to say on the issue of uh, strategy implementation. In this lesson, we tackle strategy implementation issues. You thought setting strategy was hard? Well, you've hardly begun. I love this quote from Jim Collins, that building a great company requires 1% vision and 99% alignment. 95% of employees don't understand the corporate strategy of the company they work for. And if that is true, how the heck do you expect them to help achieve the corporate objectives? So here's a few ideas that you can do once the strategy plan has been approved. First, you've got to find a way to communicate the strategy to the masses. A strategy statement is a short statement designed to communicate a lot of information about the primary objectives, the boundaries of the business, and its competitive advantage. Your employees should be enabled to have the proverbial elevator conversation and understand what the company is trying to achieve. Next, we've got to have performance measures to back up those objectives. Performance measures cascade throughout the organizations to achieve this alignment. In other words, they should be set for strategy accomplishment at the corporate, business, and functional levels. Roles and responsibilities and corporate policies and procedures need to be aligned with the strategy. This all sounds well and good, but realize that the research has shown that 92% of companies don't measure or monitor their key performance indicators. Policies represent important guidelines for an organization. Policies can help screen strategic selection, they can guide strategic implementation, and they can have a pervasive effect on organizational culture. They reinforce the values, visions, and what is important. Don't underestimate the power of setting an organizational policy. The policy can be the company's recipe for success. Take a moment here to pause the video and review the examples of Maytag, 3M, and Intel. In Great by Choice, another great book which you can find available in the Resource Center, the author, Hanson and Collins, studied paired comparison companies in similar industries. One company outperformed its peers and the market by 10 times over a period of 15 years or more. What they discovered was that this more successful company had developed a disciplined recipe. And they called this recipe the SMAC, which stands for Specific, Methodical, and Consistent. The recipe describes what the company will and will not do to remain successful, and it brings about a discipline and clarity in setting strategy. For example, the SMAC for Southwest Airlines is as shown on the screen here. To remain a short haul carrier with under two hour segments, utilizing 737s as their primary aircraft, uh, continuing to focus on high aircraft utilization, quick turns, specifying that the passenger is the number one product as opposed to uh, freight or mail, continuing to focus on low fares and high frequency servicing, staying out of the food service, 
uh, avoiding uh, interlining, specifying Texas as their number one priority market, maintaining their corporate culture, and focusing on trying to keep their business models simple. Those are all policies that Southwest Airline has established. And this recipe has remained consistent for a very long period of time, decades in fact, with very few changes that has led to their continued success over a long period of time relative to its competitors of say Delta or American Airlines. The corporate organizational structure is often the first thing that's tinkered with to align the organization for the implementation of strategy. Corporate structures are many and varied and they're set at the discretion of the CEO and the team he has assembled. If you divvy up the strategy amongst the managers, the CEO will likely adopt one or more elements of the following structures. So first you have entrepreneurial structures where everyone is a generalist and the CEO or the general manager of that business unit makes all the decisions. You may have a functional structure where you have specialized roles that are defined and staffed accordingly. The CEO establishes an executive committee for making all the major decisions. You may then get to a point where you have a divisional structure where business units themselves have resources and manage their own businesses separately. Decision making becomes more decentralized. A matrix structure is where you have a functional and a business unit structure combined at the same level in the organization. That is to say that employees have two superiors to report to. A functional manager, so for instance the CFO, as well as a business unit manager which would be the president of, say, a particular division. This type of structure combines the stability of the functional structure with the flexibility of the business line structure. And it's best used when the external environment is complex and changing. So you'll see this type of structure in, say, the aerospace industry. And finally we have a network structure. And this is an interesting and emerging structure where most of the activities are outsourced to strategic partners and that the organizational structure is in many respects the virtual organization. It's best used when the environment is unstable and there's constant change in conditions requiring innovation and a quick response. The structure provides the company with the flexibility to cope with change and the shifting patterns of trade and competition while allowing it to focus on its distinctive competencies. We see this structure evolving more and more in the uh, public sector, in government. When you drill down into the blocking and tackling of strategy implementation, you need to work through all of these sorts of activities. Programs are initiated to address strategic objectives. Be sure to include a time frame for implementation. Some initiatives will be short term and others long term. Consider the interplay between the initiatives. Some will be complementary and others will be competing for the same resources. So identifying these conflicts up front uh, is necessary and they need to be resolved before you can actually get to the uh, implementation of strategy. The goal of programming is to ensure that all the major strategic initiatives are adequately planned. Now budgets, something of which we are all familiar as finance folks, are necessary to ensure that the new programs are indeed adding shareholder value. And this is the last formal check to ensure that the strategy is both feasible and practical. Detailed implementation programs and costing may invalidate a strategic decision. And budgets are the financial bridge between the strategic plan and the annual operating plan. Next we have procedures and they detail the various activities that must be carried out in order to complete the program. Standard operating procedures ensure consistency over time and between locations. So think of the standard operating procedures used by, say, McDonald's when it rolls out a new menu item across thousands and thousands of stores. Let's flip the analysis around for a second and focus on the reasons why strategy implementation fails. And this is based on the research findings of a survey of Fortune 500 companies. Surely they would have the resources at their disposal in order to get this right. But that's not always the case, and so we can probably learn from their mistakes to summarize how we should be thinking about strategy implementation. For instance, some of the implementations pertain to the programming taking much longer than originally planned. There was unanticipated major problems that arose. Uh, there was activities that were ineffectively coordinated. 
Uh, there was competing priorities that took away from the strategy implementation initiative. The uh, strategy implementation involved employees that didn't have the capabilities to do what was asked of them. Uh, the lower level employees were inadequately trained. There was uncontrollable external environmental factors that created problems that the strategy was unable to adapt to. Uh, departmental managers providing inadequate leadership and direction. Key implementation tasks and activities that were poorly defined. And then finally, information systems that were inadequate to monitor the, uh, the activities of the strategy implementation. Which leaves us with a few lessons learned to apply to our own strategic management initiative. Number one, employees can implement what they don't know, understand, or aren't committed to. Number two, generally speaking, operational thinking and strategic thinking are different disciplines and we need to spend time aligning the folks in both camps. And number three, we can't give up on strategy when unanticipated events occur. We need to be flexible and adaptive, but we just can't throw up our arms and say it was a bad strategy to begin with. So, with that in mind, that's all for this lesson. Until next time, don't stop to get to the top, and when you get to the top, don't stop.